Hello, this is Anuja Matthew, and in this lecture, I'd like to talk about how do you know if you've been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2? So many of you have probably heard on the news that there are people who are asymptomatic, so people who have had no symptoms uh, who've been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2. So what is the test? What is one test? that you can use to determine if this person is immune or has seen SARS coronavirus 2. So an answer is to test for antibodies in your blood. And in my previous lecture, I talked about B cells and the types of antibodies that are produced in response to any infectious agent. So if you're interested in some basic immunology about B cells and antibodies, please do go back to that lecture and you would learn, I think, quite a bit about types of antibodies produced in response to viral infections. I was actually quite intrigued by an article that came out less than 25, 24 hours ago. And this article said that Germany is thinking about issuing thousands of people what's called certificates of immunity to coronavirus. And that would allow people, if they have tested positive, to leave lockdown and go back to their work. Uh, so people who test positive, for antibodies uh, would be allowed to leave the lockdown early. I mean, that's very intriguing and very interesting, uh, but how do you really test in people uh, to see whether they have antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2? And what are the issues that you should consider when you administer these tests? So how do you test for antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2? Serologic tests where you take a small aliquot amount of blood from someone who's been exposed or you think has been exposed, is quite easy. You take a small amount of blood and you test to see whether they have antibodies to any pathogen. In this case, we're looking at SARS coronavirus 2. What kinds of assays would you use? The assay that I'm gonna talk about today is an ELISA assay, but there are other assays known as say the Western blot, or even an immunofluorescence assay, all of these assays can be used to test to see if you have antibodies to a specific pathogen. So first you need to figure out what you're going to use as an antigen. So the antigen really could be a protein uh, and off from the virus. So what kinds of proteins would you use? In my lecture on viruses, I had mentioned that structural proteins, which include the spike protein, the nucleocapsid protein, the envelope protein, and the membrane protein, they form the structure of the virus. And typically, structural proteins are targets of antibodies. So any one of these proteins are a good antigen to use in an ELISA assay. So there's many kinds of ELISA assays, a direct ELISA assay, an indirect assay. But the general principle is you put in a protein of interest of, that you want to study. So in this case, you put in, say, the spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2 then you come in with your blood. So you test different dilutions of your blood. If your blood has antibodies against the spike protein, it should bind the spike protein. Then you come in with the detection reagents and substrate reagents, and these tests have to be validated rigorously. And if it's positive, you'll see a change in color. So in people that have no antibodies, you will see no change in color. In people that have antibodies, depending on the assay they use, you will see a shift in color, and that will tell you whether someone has been exposed to the virus, yes or no. So these antibody assays are relatively easy to use. Even though they're relatively easy to use, there are several considerations that need to be made. So what do you need to consider when you are developing these tests? So there's data on ELISA assays performed on SARS coronavirus that caused an outbreak in 2002, 2003, and the MERS coronavirus that caused an outbreak um, later on, 2012 or so. So these assays that were performed on SARS and MERS are going to be incredibly informative to researchers and companies developing assays to test for SARS coronavirus too. So what came out from testing of several assays on SARS and MERS is that these tests have uh, many false positives. What does that mean? So these assays can detect antibodies to other much more common coronaviruses. So there are coronaviruses that cause common cold, and these coronaviruses cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infections. 
So if your assay actually detects antibodies to these common viruses, then it's not a specific assay and it's a false positive. So you might actually have antibodies only to the common cold coronavirus, but not SARS coronavirus too. So that's not a good assay if your assay cannot distinguish between the common cold viruses, SARS, MERS, and SARS coronavirus too. The next consideration is, are you testing the right protein in your assay? As uh, mentioned, the spike protein and the nucleocapsid protein are important structural proteins on the surface of the virus. And it's been shown that both these proteins are dominant proteins that antibodies are directed to for both SARS and MERS. So it's very likely that either the spike or the nucleocapsid protein are important targets for SARS coronavirus 2. That's an educated guess. And I, I would be willing to bet that many researchers or companies that are testing assays or developing assays are using either portions of the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein in their assay. The next consideration is, are you actually using an accurate time point? When would you collect samples or blood from someone who's been exposed to SARS? Coronavirus 2. Is it a month later? Is it two months later? Is it six months later? And I'm going to talk about hypothetical scenarios in the next slide, but that's an important consideration. The next uh, consideration is, are you testing for the right function of antibodies? So antibodies can mediate, uh, can perform different functions. One important function is neutralization of the virus. So they can prevent a virus from infecting a cell. So if you have an antibody that can prevent a virus from infecting a cell, that's an excellent antibody to have. So does your assay actually test for that function or is it only testing for the ability of the antibody to bind a protein? For, for example, is the assay only testing for the ability of your antibody to bind the spike protein? So is that really useful information if it's not testing for neutralization? So you've got to think about that as well. And finally, which I think is really important to have a properly validated assay, you need well-characterized serum samples or from patients. So you need to have, say, a blood bank that has 10 or 15 samples from patients with high titers to SARS coronavirus 2. But we are currently in the outbreak. Getting serum samples at this point, uh, while it's happening, researchers have to get protocols approved to be able to collect these samples. Someone has to have a common um, reference bank to be, able, to be able to collect these samples. And ideally, the same samples will be sent to every test lab that's trying to develop an assay. That's not easily done. There's competition because everyone's trying to get the first assay up and going. So to have a properly validated assay, there's several things that need to be considered. And I've just listed some of the things that came to my mind in the last uh, day and a half or so. Uh, there's other things that also need to be considered. So in this final slide, I would like to talk about some hypothetical scenarios of what kinds of antibodies you generate and how long these antibodies really last. So in the lecture on B cells, I had mentioned that IgM antibodies are the first antibody that comes up after an infection. The antibodies, you know, rise for a little bit, uh, they last for several weeks, and then they disappear. The most dominant type of antibody is the IgG antibody. The IgG antibody typically rises and is more long lasting. So ideally, if you have an infection, so if you've had the symptomatic infection, you generate antibodies to SARS coronavirus, and they can be to multiple proteins, they can have multiple functions, but if you have a high quantity of antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2, and if those antibodies last long term, that's a fantastic outcome because you likely then are protected from being reinfected. So shown here really is days after infection. This is very soon after infection. In the first few days, you have symptoms. You're in the hospital, you have a fever, you have a cough. Uh, if you have a significant infection, this lasts for a while, but then you should hopefully recover. And then two to three weeks after you uh, have had an infection, you have a rise in antibody titers and those antibodies are detected. Ideally, they will be long lasting and six months, one year, and even 10 years after you've been exposed, hope you should have these antibodies. And that's the basis of having an effective vaccine as well. 
you try to develop a vaccine that will generate long lasting antibodies. Another scenario is you have an infection, you have this uh, rise in antibodies, which is very likely to happen, but those antibodies are not really long lasting. So what happens instead is those antibodies decline and then they go below a detection limit. So shown in this dashed line is a hypothetical titer. Above this line is having antibodies of the right titer. And if you have antibodies above this titer, you are protected. If you have antibodies below this, those, then you're not protected from an infection. So say you have an individual, someone who had symptoms, who was sick for a while, but has this high titer antibodies. This is, I would say, someone who would be considered super immune. On the other hand, if you have an individual who had antibodies for a much smaller period of time, say up to a month after infection, and then those antibodies decline to a titer below which it's protective, then this would be someone who's immune but really doesn't have a long-lasting or strong immune response. And typically, this has been shown for MERS and for, um, I think, SARS as well. People who've had very mild infections do not generate very high titers of antibodies. So for example, in some people who were exposed to MERS, they barely developed antibodies to MERS. So even though they had it, maybe they had antibodies that were only detected for a very small window and then those antibodies disappeared. Another scenario is you develop antibodies, they're long lasting, but they're just barely above the protective line. Or it's similar to someone who was exposed, but then it lasts for just a short period of time and then it disappears. So I think what's on everybody's mind is, how do I know that I'm exposed? And I've explained that already. You can do assays to detect to see if you have antibodies. There are other kinds of assays and I'll get into that in the next couple of lectures. The next question is, how long will I be immune? Or how, I mean, if I get re-exposed to the virus, am I at risk or will I be able to control infection? Most likely, if you are, have been exposed for the first time, you will develop antibodies, and it's the hope that you will develop good antibodies that can protect you. So six months later, so say late fall, we have a resurgence of SARS coronavirus again. If you're someone who has this kind of titer of antibodies, you will be protected, most likely. We don't know that yet, but it's a good educated guess. If you're someone who has very low titers, it's likely you may not be protected. It's possible and other component of your immune system, which are T cells, might be strong. And if you have low antibodies, for example, but have a good T cell response, you could still be protected. So I will talk about T cells in the next lecture, uh, next two lectures probably. Uh, if you've had, say, mild asymptomatic infection, so there are people walking around that have had no symptoms, if your antibody profile is like this, it's unlikely you'd be protected. If your antibody profile is like this, great. I mean, you may not be as good as this, as someone who was immune and had symptomatic infection, but you're above the line that's required for protection. So this is, this is a good scenario, or this is a good titer to have. If you're somebody like this, maybe if you're exposed at two months, you'll be protected. But that if you get exposed, say a year out, it's unlikely you'll be protected. So this is just a hypothetical graph uh, showing you what the variability of antibody titers are likely to be in individuals exposed to SARS. Uh, we make guesses based on our uh, experience with other similar viruses that have been tested rigorously. And we hope that SARS is quite, I mean, the immune response or the antibody response to SARS coronavirus 2 is similar. My concern really is there are many assays that are coming out. They seem to be coming out at um, at this breakneck speed, and I'm concerned that these assays have not been validated rigorously. Uh, my hope is they will be tested and uh, people will be willing to wait um, to have a rigorously tested assay before jumping on uh, testing thousands of people to see if they're immune. So thank you again uh, for your attention. This is Anuja Matthew.